So, uh, tonight's uh, presentation is Artist Residency by um, Patricia Healy McMeans, who is an artist, researcher, and um, co producer of uh, projects taking the form of artist residencies, social sculptures, sound, and uh, particip uh, participatory printed matter. Her work investigates how uh, intensities of experience, um, radical hospitality, and a slow immersion within the artist-led social studio leads to a unique uh, residential learning uh, and a new practice uh, for the artist. Since 2012, um, she's run iterative experimental artist uh, residency events in her two uh, home bases, Minneapolis and Edinburgh in the UK. Uh, for international setup, emerging artists call uh, 10 Chances Art Res. Working with other artist builders, uh, they have built an artist um, live work project called uh, Movable Fist uh, Bothy, a modular uh, 9 feet by 12 feet Bothy or hot that can be broken down and uh, reassembled in a new location in a few hours by several sets of hands. Uh, she holds an MFA in Sculpture and Combined Media from the University of Minnesota and has recently earned her practice-led PhD in Contemporary Art and Practice as, at Edinburgh uh, College of Art, studying how artists learn whilst on residency. Primarily identifying as an artist, her strategies uh, continue to place the um, artist first and uh, give them room uh, to move. Uh, also, I was so lucky to be able to uh, co-teach classes with um, Patty this semester and last semester, and hopefully more. So thank you so much, Patty, for um, being here. Uh, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen, so you can go ahead and start. Uh, there we go. Yes. Can you hear now me we now? Can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I know some people in this Zoom room um, because I, um, t I have you right now for a grad prep one uh, for the second years, but others I don't know. So hi, uh, welcome to, to this talk. Um, okay, I'm just going to share my screen and then just get started. Um, I, I did tell Ziba and I asked her to email you all just to say that I'd like to be done with my talk by 7.30 and I've got my alarm set here, 7.30, 7.35. So we have enough time for um, questions and, and answers because I feel like this topic is really prescient for a lot of young artists, or artists of any age really. <clears throat> and so I want to answer whatever I don't cover um, in, in my talk. So let me just share my screen. It's going to take me just a second to get. OK, that is not the slide I want to be on. Hold on one second. <laughs> um, OK, great. Here we are, artist residencies today. So first, I just kind of want to talk about, um, I'll cover several things in the course of this half hour, but just a brief history of artist residencies. Um, so they were the accepted beginnings or the normative beginnings of them go back to the early 1900s, um, which are these kind of early artist benefactor relationships, which are often like kind of the Richies, like the Richie Riches of like, um, you know, the East Coast, uh, the Mellons, the MacArthur's, the um, railroad magnets um, who who would have a sort of favorite artist uh, from Europe often that they would want to have come to their like lake home um, for like eight months and then they would invite kind of their rich friends to come and hang out with them and eat with them and um, and and um, watch them make their art and and kind of you know talk about art to whatever extent they could so that's kind of the sort of goes back to that and then that kind of has you know blossomed into into other kinds of um forms of artist residencies but just to say that like that is kind of being challenged now um by recent scholarship um like people are wanting to put in the inclusion of black mountain college in north carolina 
from uh, 1935 to 56. And also, I'm going to mess up this word, but Vorpsfeed, um, which is this enclave of like artists and thinkers who gathered for uh, short amounts of time uh, in Bremen. And that was a kind of about that same time, a little bit earlier that was happening, of course, in Europe. Um, different considerations like for the traveling journeymen, nomad cultures like the Bedouins in um, um, Morocco, um, Islamic traveling practices, early universitas forms, which the university was actually originally formed by traveling scholars who would literally go from like hearth to hearth and gather in different places, mostly in Europe, but also in Asia. Um, and uh, kind of those now being started, start to be thinking of as like the, the, the first like artist residencies um, um, that, that would uh, lead to what we now know today. So um, also just that there was a big spike in artist residencies in 1990s, which happened across the globe. Um, it was most, I mean, it's mostly documented in like Western Europe and the US, so like in Western culture, but it was actually happening everywhere. Um, and this would be like from the advent, I mean, for many reasons, but the one of the main ones is the advent of the internet and globalism kind of creating this new way for people to connect and travel, to be with each other, to kind of rub elbows and, and make work. Um, uh, there's some documentation too that like, I think by like 2000, um, the number of applicants for a particular residency on average was 11 applications to one position. And I would sort of argue that that's probably now kind of even more astronomical in terms of like how many people apply per position for residencies. But that's not to deter you. Like you definitely should apply for residencies if that's the thing you want to do. Um, okay, so before COVID, there were about 4,000 residencies, over 4,000 residencies, I would say, globally. And this was taken like through my PhD work. I just did an assessment of the four main databases to see how many were being offered. Um, now we don't really know because that hasn't that assessment hasn't been done again, and many residencies likely closed uh, during COVID and did not reopen. But also some new ones have probably started and boomed. So um, we don't know the numbers, but just just so you kind of know, there are like that many um, out there like around the world. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to jump into that. These are the big four, I always call them. These are the organizations and sites that hold this data for you, like which residencies, where are they? Uh, are they discipline specific? How do I get on them? When are the applications? Those kinds of things. So let's just look at each one of these. Trans artists, you may have heard of. That's kind of the most, I would say, well-known one. Um, it is out of Amsterdam, and it's in coordination with Dutch culture. Um, they have global... Uh, listings, so kind of everywhere in the world. Um, there's a small fee for uh, the AR or the, the artist residency itself to list itself on their uh, website. Uh, it has the most numbers. Um, and let's just go ahead and click on that link so you can kind of see what that is about. So this is what their website looks like when you go to it. Um, they have their open calls listed right on the top of their um, homepage. They also have, I have already bypassed the screen, but when you get on here, the first thing that'll pop up is how you sign up for their newsletter. And I would really recommend for these, uh, these four big databases and any of the other kind of smaller ones that you might want to um, um, know about to subscribe to their newsletters because they'll send out a newsletter like once a month with their open calls that are coming um, and you can be like abreast of that like immediately. But right here, so it's the about residencies here, there's kind of a checklist and some other things, and then the AIR database. So I'll just go to find your residency so you can see what that looks like on this particular website, if it will open. Okay, all right. So you can see the map here. So this is saying that like in North America, uh, this trans artist is listing you know, 187 websites on the East Coast, 85 on the West Coast, four up here in Alaska. Um, it's got, oh, let's see. If I click on this, what will happen? I don't want it to start spinning out here. Um, if you click through this, then it'll tell you. It's got 863 in Europe, 27 in Scandinavia, 15 in Iceland. Um, anyway, you can get in here and you can start looking around and choosing using the map feature, but also just to look and see 
that has a region here, you can put that in where you would like to uh, look for residencies, specifically the country, and then the discipline. But these are the search filters that it gives you. Um, and then you would hit apply and then it would show um, those for you. Um, okay, I'm gonna pop out of trans artists for now and go back to my slide presentation. Um, so trans artists is definitely like kind of one of the main ones. On their website, they also have lots of different like studies that have been done, different kinds of reports, uh, sort of like um, some advice for like artists who want to go on residency. Okay, then the second one is trans artists. I'm sorry, res, art, res artists, res artists. And that one is in Australia, housed in Australia now. It does have global listings. It's a larger fee for the residency itself to list itself on there, which means that a lot of the smaller residencies or startup residencies or ones that are like uh, led by artists um, won't pay to get listed there. So if you want to go to a place that's kind of like a staple or a residency, residency that's been around for a long time, Res Artists is gonna have those on there. They'll also be on Trans Artists. Some of these like have you know the same residencies cross listed on, on all of these websites. But um, yeah, so Res Artists is vetted. Um, the numbers that are there like don't change too much. They have about a thousand residencies that they list and it doesn't change often. But I'll go to that real quick just so you can see what that looks like. It takes a little bit for the Res Artists site to um, load because it's got so much on there. So right from its homepage, you can kind of toggle around um, and click on which part of the map of the world you would like to start looking for residencies. Um, and then if you scroll down, it's got news, events, open calls, and I'll just click on open calls so you can see what that looks like. There's a lot on there, so it takes a little bit to load. All right. Uh, so right off the bat, it's got these search filters, application deadline. So if you're saying like, I want something where the application is right now, you can put that in there and then country. So you would select your country. And then this just has several different residencies that have an open call at the moment. I would definitely sign up for this um, newsletter. I get them, you know, like once a month. Uh, and so it's really nice because it's like, these are the ones that are kind of due now and they tell you uh, where they are. So, okay, let me go back to my slideshow. All right. And then, um, oops, sorry. The next one is the Artists Communities Alliance, ACA it's called. That's the only one, uh, that's not true. It's, it's the only like kind of one that has been around for 30 years that is based out of the US. Um, and it's at the minute out of Providence, Rhode Island. It has lists mostly US uh, residencies, though it does have some that are around the globe. There is a fee for the AR to list. I don't know how much it is, so I'm not exactly sure how prohibitive that is. It's very artist friendly, I've found, that Artist uh, Communities Alliances. So let's just go there real quick. I'm gonna share this tab. Um, yeah, so right off the bat, the home screen is split. On one side is for organizations, on the other side is for artists. So you can right away get looking at um, resources for artists, upcoming deadlines, programs and events. So this one, explore the network. So you can kind of get in here and really check out what's going on. Um, this one I do actually want to go in and see. Um, I think it's under the, it's under the directory. I'm trying to remember. Open calls. Let's go to open calls. All right, so um, right off the bat, right here on the left side, you can see in this left nav bar, um, all of the search filters that it has. So you can put in the country that you want it to, you want it to search for, um, the discipline, and there's a lot of disciplines there. Um, if you wanted to, a uh, collaborative residency, if you're applying as a team, um, what else? Family friendly, meals provided, accessible housing, um, application type to be uh, apply. Some of them are by invitation only, but some of them um, are like you then apply yourself. Um, yeah. And so you can uh, set your own search filters and then hit apply. And it will just show you the ones in their database that uh, have those kinds of needs that you're looking for. Okay, and back to the slideshow here. Sorry, my trackpad is all kind of messed up for me. All right, and then the next one I wanna talk about is Rivet. 
And Rivet is pretty interesting because uh, it's out of New York. Uh, it lists global residencies. There's no fee for a residency to be listed on there. So it will kind of show anyone can have their residency listed on there. Like I've had my residency listed on there. Um, so it has a lot of kind of like liminal and artist led residencies, things that are happening that are maybe quite temporary that are only around just kind of for this moment. Um, and it also has a funding search filter. So of the four kind of big ones, this is the only one where you can search for funding. So let's go ahead and click on there and I'll share this tab. Right, so this is what the homepage looks like. And right off the bat, you can search for country or whatever. And then with funding, free no costs or with costs. And this is kind of the basic breakdown of artist residencies. Some of them will pay you. And some of them are um, free, no costs, meaning like they're not going to pay you a stipend to be there. Like you're not going to actually make income to be there, but your, your like accommodation will be covered. Your studio, uh, you know, space will be covered. Like it's sort of a break even situation. And then with costs, meaning like you actually have to pay for those things. Um, so all of the other websites, you have to kind of like locate the kind of residency that you want based on country and discipline and et cetera. And then you have to kind of do a dive down into each one to see which ones actually require you to pay and which ones will pay you. So this, for me, this has always been one of my beefs about these websites is that it's very kind of like not artist friendly. Um, in that way, right? Because this is kind of a prescient question that artists always want to know, how much is it going to cost me? Uh, can I find one that, that has funding? So I highly suggest Rivet for that, um, that um, feature. All right, so let me go back to my, my screen now. Okay, so then there are these smaller regional sites. So those ones are like global. They have like listings kind of all over the world. But these ones are started often by like uh, artist curators, independent artist curators or artists themselves. Uh, the first is China Residencies. I'll just pop there really quick. You can see that. So this is actually listing um, a whole network of residencies in China um, and listing their open calls and other things. You can see that by their, um, their uh, nav bar up here at the top. Okay, and then I'll go back to my slideshow. The next is um, the uh, North Africa Cultural Mobility Map. Um, and I'll click on that, this is a really lovely site. This one really like does a good job of, um, of um, kind of plotting out uh, as many of the artist residencies in the Maghreb region as, as possible. This is like done by a friend of mine who's a scholar who lives in Barcelona, um, but has done a lot of work um, in the North African and Middle East region. Um, so here's a map, interviews, funding, resources, etc. I'm kind of blowing through these because um, I'm, I'm wary of time. So um, please, we'll share the slide deck so you can have these links and you can go in here. The next is a Scottish residency map. Um, this one is uh, something I've done as part of my PhD. Um, and we'll click right here and I'll take you to it. So this is actually an interactive map. It's on Google. And you can see the different Scottish residencies are plotted here. And when you click on them, I thought it was when you hover, but I think when you click, it tells you quite a bit about them. Um, and if you're alone or if you're with people, if it's funded or not funded, um, those types of things. Okay, and then popping back. So uh, this is located in the Trans Artists website, but these are regional maps in here. So I'm just gonna click there real quick so we can see that. Okay, so these are mappings of residency opportunities. Here's in Belgium, here's in France, a couple of the different ones in France. So they're just kind of holding together like other people's uh, work that they've done mapping these specific regions. Finland, Germany, Spain, United Kingdom, then European wide, just one in North America here, one in South America. So just kind of the ones that they've come across or their or their uh, people who are in their networks have like told them about, but this is a good location to kind of like find those in one spot. Um, okay, and then here are some residencies for BIPOC. Um, 
uh, residents. So if you're an artist who's interested in like going to uh, work with those kinds of um, communities, I'll just click there. Patty, it's still showing the trans artists residencies. Okay, never mind. Oh, sorry. Are we no, good? Okay. Yeah. I okay. Think so. Yeah. Back at my slideshow, it'll, it'll, it'll like link you through to here, but thanks for telling me that's it. Yeah. Sure, I think sure. I just didn't hit the right button at the top. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is like a, uh, a, a search filter that was put into like the um, ACA website, which is the one that's here in the U S um, that is just for um, uh, BIPOC artists, uh, res those residencies. And so you can just kind of scroll through here and see um, which ones those are. And this is kind of a long list um, of us because I applied the sort filter. Um, and so you can kind of do that uh, on your own and follow that link and see what those are about. Um, okay, and I'll go back to the slideshow. All right. Oh, I'm totally gonna run out of time, you guys. I'm sorry. I'll try and run through this. Artists at Risk is a, um, a organization that's been around for a while that is actually like, um, holds together artist residencies that serve to um, give a safe space to artists who are from countries that are war-torn um, and who really need like shelter. Um, and so I'm just gonna go to their website really quickly. They did a lot of work with the Ukraine war and serving Ukraine artists. Um, here, there we go. So artists at risk is something um, that is a really particular uh, thing, but I just wanted to show you that there are um, artist residencies kind of serve in this way or work in this way um, to provide like visas and um, uh, you know places for um, artists to uh, uh, go to, to, to be safe. Um, yeah, so artists at risk is, is pretty important. Um, okay, back to my slideshow here. I won't click through these. You're welcome to do that when you get the slide deck. Um, Swedish Artist Resident Network, all artists residencies in Sweden, Nordic Alliance on Climate Action. This is between like Scandinavian countries, Iceland, Greenland, uh, Scotland. Um, I think that that's all the ones in there. But another way to kind of like, if you're interested in doing uh, work that is about a particular topic, um, that is also like kind of um, under the rubric of a certain location. This is how you would sort of find that. Okay, so just a quick, oh, here we go. Ask yourself, what am I looking for? Um, so buy-in or authorship and attention. Like, do you want to have, what kind of buy-in do you want to have in a residency? Some of them are very kind of hands-off, meaning like you come, you do your thing kind of on your own and then you leave. And some of them are, are more interactive like with the hosts that are there, uh, with the other artists, with the people who are even like the instigators who are running it, the residency runners. So kind of ask yourself that, uh, what are you looking for in terms of that? Um, and in experiential learning unique to residencies. Um, this is like a kind that's gained only by being on residency. What do you, how do you feel about experiential learning? I guess is a good question to ask yourself because it is very much about your body being present in the space and kind of giving yourself over to that. Um, are you looking for a trusted space to not be afraid to fail? Residencies can provide that. Um, to be paid for your time and attention and your research and your intellectual labor, not necessarily for output. There are residencies that are for research only and not for output, um, though you can also find those if that's what you want. Do you want a resume builder? Do you wanna have a show? Do you just want time away from your everyday life? Some people really want that, right? You just want to like, you know, sit alone and like read for a while. Do you want to have a studio space, a space to make? There are some residents who are, sorry, some artists who live in like urban centers who can't afford to have studios. And so they actually use residencies as a studio. Like they, they, they plan to go on residency so that they have like a month or six months or however long to uh, you know, make this work. And then they kind of plan a show for the end of that. Um, do you wanna uh, to be with others or to be alone in a hut in the woods? Like these are things to ask yourself. Um, and we'll get to that more in a second. Um, right, so a quick breakdown of typology. Who is there? So there's residencies that are solo, meaning it's you and you go off into a hut in the woods by yourself. 
um, or it's social, meaning like you're with a group of people and you're kind of all elbow to elbow, like making your work um, sometimes really intensely, um, but and and like an an immersion, but sometimes like just parts of the day, or you come together for dinner every night, or whatever. Um, and then intent. So, do you want to? Uh, some of them just you have your own output, like you as an individual artist. Some of them you have a group output, like all the artists together, like collectively uh, pursue one idea. Um, or research only, where like there is no output, there's nothing really uh, tangibly being made. It's just, you're just there for research on your own. Um, okay, and so then typology is also format. So Atelier Studio, that's kind of the, the, the thing that we normally think of, where it's like you and your work will be generated inside of an individual studio on the premises of the residency. Or a social studio, where your work will generate in a collective studio, meaning like there's gonna be a big room, and you're going to have a spot at a table and someone else is going to have a spot at a table over there and over there and over there. Um, and you're going to be working on your own things, but you'll also kind of come together into this sort of hive mind at different moments. Um, then there's a socially engaged residency, um, which is, you know, we all know what socially engaged art is, but where work generates outward and it lives in and with the locality, the community, like Devon Arts. Um, where their mantra is the town is the venue. And I'm just going to really quick go to the Devron website um, because it is unique. Um, so uh, Devron Arts is actually in a small town in the Highlands in Scotland. And they uh, have all socially engaged artists who come and do work in the town. So the town really is the venue. So like an artist might choose to do work with the people in the town, but like at the hardware store or at the like carpet store. Um, it's like, it's kind of really unique and really specific. I, I, try, I went there when I, when I was doing my PhD in Scotland and it, and it was really kind of exceptional. So there are other residencies that are for socially engaged artists. This is just the main one that I know of, but there are other ones out there. So if kind of that's your jam. This might be something that you want to look into. Okay, and then back to my slideshow, all right. Uh, then the other kind of format for residency is like inside a government or business, like an artist kind of being the artist in residence in one of those spaces goes all the way back to like Bell Labs in the 50s and 60s, um, where they had an artist come in and uh, do work with all of their like transmitters and things like that. And I also have Sarah Peterson, our lovely Sarah here, um, who just had a residency this last year um, where she was the artist in resident in residence inside MnDOT. So if you're interested in doing that kind of work, like talk to Sarah or talk to me, um, but there definitely, that is a thing that is out there. Um, and then there's also a traveling residency, which is maybe a little bit more rare, but a traveling residency is literally that you don't go to just one place or one site or one locality, you travel for your residency. So your residency might be three or three to five months long, but you travel through a different place like throughout throughout it so it's kind of nomadic um the one that i uh a couple i've listed here are signal fire and washington state and i'm just going to share my tab here real quick signal fire has been around since 2009 and this literally is where like artists sign up to be on this residency and everybody has a different entry point like into the woods into the, which which is also like the mountains of a mountain of Washington. And um, you have like a you have like a syllabus and you have like readings and you have like a backpack, right? And you kind of like make your way to the base camp. Um, and then there's like a big tent where everybody kind of joins and talks about the reading and um, and then has dinner together and then kind of like keeps moving on. Um, so it's really interesting, I think, but a very different you know type of residency. But these are out there. Um, okay, and then I'm going to go back to here. Calendar uh, Lateral Lab, you can follow that link when you get the slide deck. That is actually like you plot your own nomadic residency um, through Japan. And then Japanese, and I think there was one Dutch artist who did that same thing through Scotland. And then there is a show where the J Japanese and the Scottish uh, artists meet. Um, but that it is open to like other artists. This has just kind of been the model so far, but look at calendar lab if that's something that you're interested in, um, where you are actually plotting where you go 
for that to happen. Okay, and then who uh, who is it led by? Like, or how is it structured, the artist residency? Is it artist-led, meaning a couple artists that got together and said, like, hey, let's do this thing? Um, and then that's how that started, um, which will have a very different kind of vibe, you know, to it. Or is it institutionally led? Like, is it um, uh, Bemis... Uh, Center for the Arts, which is a residency that's been around for decades, um, or is it embedded also as part of an institution, which happens these days, um, which just means it'll have a different feel and the funding will come differently. And also different things will probably be required of you, like you'll probably be required to meet with curators and meet with different um, people almost every day that you're on residency. So it will be less like kind of your own time to yourself, uh, potentially. All right, and then funding, this is the big question, right? Um, some of them are paid and some of them like you pay to play, like you pay to be there, right? And then there's also the break even situation that we kind of talked about where accommodation and food, for example, is paid for, but you have to you know, still pay your own rent back home and those kinds of things. Um, okay, so these are some links to fully funded residencies. I'm not gonna click through all of them in the interest of time, um, but they are here. When you get the slide deck, you can look at them. The first one is actually pretty comprehensive. It's only on Instagram. It has a website, but the website actually isn't as like populated, but it is on Instagram and um, it lists like calls that are right now and it will only list fully funded residencies. So each one of these links will take you there. All right. So being on residency is like a little bit of improv. Um, it's a bit of like, you know, kind of jumping in and uh, undergoing. It's a bit of like kind of blowing on the trumpet for the first time because you're not quite sure what's going to happen when you get there. So it's kind of like saying yes and, which is the sort of, um, you know, thing that they always say in improv. Like you can't say no to anything. You just say yes and. Um, and I thought that was kind of great. So this is this cheeky little um, picture of this kid who's like sort of enticing you to jump into this lake with him. Um, I love this little picture. I'll keep going on. Um, I don't know if I should do this because this is a bit about how I came to residencies from sculpture to social sculpture. Maybe I'll just go through it really quickly. Um, basically up until 2004, um, I was a sculptor and I was an object maker. And then I began kind of making installations. So something bigger and more immersive. And then I started making freestanding rooms that you could like approach from the outside and then also enter into. So it was very experiential and much larger scale. And it really made me think about like people, like, oh, people, um, yeah. Like that's the really exciting part about all of this are, the, are is the interactions of the people in these spaces. So I began to really like lose the object and the material focus um, in my work. And now I kind of center sharing and conversation and events and learning, I would say as well. And, and then also from uh, around 2000, I started uh, work on this co uh, traveling show that I co-curated that started in Minneapolis. Um, at the soap factory and then over the course of a year and a half traveled to London and then traveled to uh, New, uh, New York City. Sorry, there's a typo there, but New York City. And that was uh, um, um, 24 artists and eight from Minneapolis, eight from London and eight from New York. And um, so everybody was kind of was able to show in their hometown, but then also show in these other towns. And much to my surprise, at the very first opening at the soap factory in Minneapolis, all of the artists came. So all the artists from London came and New York came and everybody was in situ for a whole week uh, installing the show and you know doing different things and talking about all these things and very elbow to elbow. And then they left after the week and went back to their four corners of the world. And then they uh, came back together again for that week in London and then uh, left and then came back together for that week in New York. And so this was kind of a real like learning experience for me about like, what I was into and what really like, um, you know, pumped me up was this kind of interaction that was like intense for like a week long and then would go away. Um, so that had a lot to do with how I started getting into residencies. And then of course in 2004, I started teaching hands-on studio classes. Um, I got my MFA from the U and they are a teaching institution. It's a three-year MFA. Um, and so uh, teaching for me was very like non-hierarchical and really a lot about sharing knowledges. Um, and so that definitely, it was the confluence of these three things at that time that kind of led me into residencies. Um, 
Yeah. And then in 2011, uh, I was on a road trip with a friend and I had this epiphany on the hood of my Prius that was like, oh my God, I think I'm 42 years old. I think I want to start an artist residency, which seemed like the craziest thing you could do, right? Um, and then in 2012, the very next summer, I had my first iteration of what I called 10 Chances, artist residency, this experiment. Um, and I was really like looking at how I could have uh, if I had nine artists, how I could have four or five local artists here in Minneapolis, and then four that were not from here were from uh, others at that time, like it was mostly U.S. based. So other states. Um, and um, what would it mean to be able to like really investigate this exchange between local residents and then guest residents who were in from out of town? Um, and how I did that was. We had one studio, this is actually like Glam Doll Donuts. I don't know if you can like figure that out by looking at that image of the inside, which used to be um, Lai's uh, Deli. Um, and we kind of took it over for this summer um, and, and had it be our studio HQ. Anyway, everybody had 24 hour access to the studio, but our sleeping arrangements were such that the out of town residents stayed in the homes of the local residents for that month. Um, which created this really intimate bond. And it's this kind of like, it's a thing I've done with all of my residencies now. And I began doing like an exchange. So like if you had a, a, um, a guest residence co come and stay with you in your house for a month, then a couple months later, you would go stay with them in their house for a month in whatever state or country they live in. So it became this exchange and it's really lovely. Um, okay, and then also it was flexible. It worked around the local people's work schedules. So if you had to go to work, you could just go to work because everybody had 24 hour access. So if you had to keep your job from like, you know, nine to two or whatever you could. Um, and also everybody got paid. So um, it wasn't a whole ton of money, but every artist and every host got paid as well. And here's just some Im images of some of those years, um, the groups and some of the things we did. Right, and then when I got to Edinburgh, I moved there to Edinburgh, Scotland in 2014 to do my PhD. Um, and this was like, um, I did these two big projects. I did another version of the 10X Art Res, uh, which is the slide here on the, um, on the, on the uh, right. And then I did this project called Movable Feast Bothy, which is, which is this built structure. Um, and so I had a team of artists I was working with and we, we, could, we could put this together in a half a day and take it apart in a half a day and move it to another part of the city. And we had, it was a gallery, it was a sleep space, it was um, a whole bunch of different things. Uh, film screenings happened there, um, all sorts of things. So I was really experimenting with building. I'll just skip past this slide. That's okay, we don't need to go into that. And here are just some more images of those. This was the Scotland version. I was experimenting with spending a few of the first days in a rural environment. So this was in uh, the right, the left side here was in Braywell House in Gifford, a small village. And then the right side here was when we went into the city then in Edinburgh for two weeks. So I was kind of experimenting with that like intensity of being in a small rural environment and then moving into the city. The same thing here in Minnesota. I was at Night Owl Farm up in North Branch. And then we moved into Northeast Minneapolis, which is a Cameron Gaynor's old uh, space. And um, that's now a dream song in Northeast. All right, I'll just flip through these. All right, so this is how I wanna wrap this up. And then I wanna give room for Q and A and I'm happy to stay later than eight o'clock. Um, so what is the invitation of this moment? Who do you wanna be at your dinner party? Like that's kind of a, um, a provocative question, but really like, who do you want to spend this time with when you go on residency? What kind of conversation do you want to have? Um, who do you want to be provoked by? Um, those, those, these are the questions to start asking when you're thinking about which ones. How present do you want or need to be for others? Um, it could be not very much. You want to totally hole up inside yourself. So then look for those residencies that don't require that of you. Um, so being present could be for your host, the other residents, curated people brought into you, which will happen, especially if it's an institutional residency. It means they're going to bring in curators from their town, from their institution, from their university that they want you to meet with. Um, it also could just be random people on the street. Um, what is most important to you about this experience that you're about to have? Is it critique, sharing food, cranking out work, just sleeping and reading, having a show at the end? All of these are valid. Um, 
you know, whichever is your answer, you're answering yes to, they're all valid. So don't feel like you, it has to be, you know, one way or another. Um, what pathways are you opening up for yourself and how are you embedding longevity beyond the residency time? What kind of like um, networks are you trying to make? I hate that word sometimes, but I will say like friendships, artistic friendships, do you want to make that will continue beyond the month or two that you're in residence? What are your actual needs for the residency time? You need to bring your family. There are family residencies. Look for those. You need to get paid. Okay, maybe you don't need to get paid, but you need to at least break even. Okay, so there's that. You need to be able to also work remotely for your real job some of the time. That's a reality. So look for residencies that allow that. What are your wants for the residency time? You want to work alone in your studio and not be bothered. Okay. You want to make food for and with others. That's an important thing. Like this image is a dinner party. Like that's look for those that like have those kinds of like elements to them. You want to learn a specific task like book binding or how to skin a rabbit. They have uh, residencies that are specifically for um, uh, learning a task or, um, or a, a, a skill or a trade. So look for that. You want to be with other people who are thinking about a specific topic that you are, such as climate change or the sublime or indigenous rituals. There are lots of topic-based residencies that are out there. Um, so look for those as well. And those will be all in these databases. Um, you want to work inside a company or the government because you do socially engaged work, or, or you will find use in their products or ways of doing things such as Kohler has a residency. So if you're a ceramicist or a sculptor, like the Kohler residency might be for you because you can use all of their, um, all of their, oh my gosh, shops and things, um, or bear paints, for example, um, because then you can experiment with all of their paints. Um, you simply want to build your CV. So residencies these days are a CV builder. That's a thing that, is, that has been true for the last 10 years. Um, in part, that's because of the breakdown of like uh, higher education, um, the, like higher education being too expensive for, for people, especially for artists. They see a different path for themselves. And so as opposed to where did you go to grad school, um, it's also where, did, where have you done residencies? Um, so think about that. All right. Um, consider the difference between being a tourist and a traveler. Those are two different things. And um, artist residents and artist residencies get a bad rap for like being tourists and like parachuting in on a community and then leaving and um, not really caring about what's happening. And then think about what it means to be a traveler and what that footprint looks like. Do you want this experience to be in a city or in the country or potentially in between? Um, residencies happen everywhere. And so you can uh, be very specific about uh, what kind of um, striated or smooth experience you want to have. What spaces, localities, sites do you and can you occupy? Think about that, especially as it pertains to your work. What kinds of carbon credit can you imagine for yourself? What do you want to learn? It is about learning. Are you prepared to be both a host and a guest? No matter what happens, if you go to Barcelona, Spain and go to somebody's residency project there where there's like eight different people, there will be times when you are a host and a guest. You might be asked to make dinner one night for everybody. And you'll be asked to maybe make a recipe from where you're from or a family recipe or something like that. So um, there's lots of ways to be that you will be asked to be both of those things. How do you think about radical hospitality? It's a good question ask yourself. All right. And one last recommendation that I have before I open this up to Q&A is just this really great book that came out in 2019. And it's um, Reclaiming Time and Space. And it is a series of essays that really talk about kind of the types of knowledge production that come out of residencies. So that's what I have for now. And I'm happy to take Q&A. Sorry that I went on so long, but I'm happy to stay here for I mean, another half hour if we need. Um, let me go back to, uh, or how do I get out? Stop sharing. Here we go. And we'll get back to the Zoom room. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, there we go. I'm in the Zoom room now. Hi, everyone. I can see everyone now. <laughs> I myself have some questions, but I let everyone uh, ask their question, and then um, I'll ask mine. So I can see a few questions in chat. Uh, okay. 
I wanted to see if uh, Victor wants to ask them de um, uh, themselves or uh, want me to uh, read them. So, okay, I can go ahead and read them. Uh, the first one is who? Who is uh, the first one? Is uh, can you put a hold on your student loan payments yeah. while attending a residency? If not, what would you suggest? Are you paid enough uh, via stipend or another way to pay your student loan? That's a great question. And unfortunately, there's not a way to put your student loan payments on hold where you're in a residency. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not like um, regarded in that way where it's like uh, going on to do if you, a PhD or further school beyond whatever uh, level you're in right now. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, and it, you know, it, it depends because I don't know how much your student loans are, would be, but like, um, are you paid enough by a stipend? Um, I would say you're lucky to be paid enough to like pay your rent at home. Um, so probably not to pay your student loans, but that's a super great question. I mean, there's so many like failures in the system. <laughs> Sarah. I could, yeah, I could just say something real quick about that. Um, yeah. If your student, and I, I'm happy to talk to people if they want to about some of this stuff one-on-one um, -on -one or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but I can say that if, you're, if your student loans are all federal student loans um, from like government loans, um, you can apply for income-driven repayment after you um, oh, yeah, finish school which is really important and good to do. And it means that your, um, it means that every, your monthly payments are reasonable based on your income amount. And under a certain, if you're making under a certain amount per year, or technically if you made under a certain amount in the last tax year, which is like $30,000 or something, or I don't know, it changes, but your, your, your payment, your monthly payment amount is like zero and it counts as a payment. So if you're going through a time where you're not making a lot of money, but you are registered for mm -hmm. an income driven repayment plan, you're, um, you actually can um, be paying mm -hmm. nothing for uh, every month and it counts as a payment. It, it, mm -hmm. it, you really don't start paying money until a certain point. So that's just one thing to say if you're, sometimes if you're having a year where you're not making a lot of money, it can be great because you may not really be paying much on your student loan. And if you can find residencies that allow you to um, break even or make money, that can be a thing that a lot of people end up doing afterward. Yeah. Yes. And also there's like a, uh, there, you could, you have, you're allowed so many months of forbearance. And so if you're yeah, going to go do a residency months. for one month, I mean, most yeah. residencies are between like three weeks and then I guess like kind of a month, three months, six months at the outside, they're going to be nine months or a year, but that's kind of an exception um, that they would be that long. So it's kind of like you can do, you know, kind of put these things in place for like a month to be like these kind of, you know, levies, these like stop gaps um, to allow you to kind of go, go do something like this. Um, and Victor, you had another question. Let me just, Who's interested in you as an artist when documenting your work, when you show what you've learned in your residency? Oh, wow. What do you mean by that question? Well, it's like um, when people are interested in inviting you, who do you, who, who would you, who would be most interested in you as an artist so that you can share some of the things like what you're doing, like share some of the things that you've learned and maybe encourage, encourage, the act of engaging in residencies or uh, students learning something about what you've learned in your residency. I don't know. I, it's real student mentor kind of question driven. <laughs> no, I get it. Sure. Um, do you mean like, um, I, when you, your question is when you say, when you show what you've learned in your residency, do you mean my residency specifically? Well, or do you mean like one that you might go on? That's great. I, I, would love to hear your thoughts on, on a residency that you've experienced and then also how that works um, in, in a way where if there's a re residency I've attended and I come back, who, if people aren't reaching out to me and asking me what I did, mm. who can I reach out and say, hey, look, I've done this. 
would you be interested in me talking about it? Oh, uh, wow. That's a specific Therapy question. No. Um, I don't know. I feel like that's a really like specific question and it depends like, um, um, like if you've done work at a residency and then like you come back to your home sort of place and want to talk to somebody about like the work that you've done or want to be able to like present it is, I think that's how I'm interpreting your question, Victor. Um, yeah. Okay. Then, um, I think you would just have to like talk to the people that are at like, um, well, I mean, for instance, like at MCAD, of course, like you could talk to us and we might be like, sure, like do an artist talk and so people can see what you did. Um, or you can go to like um, some of the galleries in town, like Hair and Nails or um, um, uh, some of the smaller ones, uh, public functionary, and ask if like they would be interested in you uh, giving sort of a talk about like the work that you made. Great. Are there other questions? I feel like there's probably a lot of questions and everyone's being really so, shy. Uh, uh, please feel free to send your question in chat or just open your mic and ask your question. Yeah. Ziba, go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Let me find my notes. Okay. Um, I have a question. Sure, okay, Liz. Uh, do you want to go first? Uh, no, you go ahead first. Okay. Um, I am curious about like what specific skill sets you recommend artists developing in order to be a strong candidate. I'm sure it varies, right, based on the residency and like the jury or whatever. But um, maybe just like a general. Yeah. No, that's a good question. And one of the things I know I didn't talk about in my slides was about artist selection. Um, and like, how do you even get chosen to be on a residency, right? I mean, I was sort of positioning the whole thing, but you're in the driver's seat. Like, ask yourself, what question, what, what, how do you answer these questions? What kind of thing do you want to be on? Um, which is imperative and good and good. But also then like, how do you get one is another thing. Um, and I would say that, like, I don't know that there's a skill set necessarily, unless you are looking to be on a residency where you want to learn how to skin a rabbit and they're looking for people who, like, are, are good with knives. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> but, like, then you would want to, like, show that you know how to do that thing, right, in your, in, your, in your slides that you're sending, your images that you're sending along. But that's a really specific thing. For the most part, they're going to ask for probably 10 images or a bit of video. Um, and then they're going to ask you for a proposal. And uh, often it's like, here's what I propose to do with my month. Um, I'm going to push my work further in this area. Um, it might be like, um, you know, it, it's, it doesn't have to be like, um, it's usually not that they're asking for something really formal and super concrete. It's a bit more kind of um, open-ended um, because often you don't really know what you want to do when you get there. But But you're saying like, um, you know, I want to continue to pursue my work into um, um, media makers who, uh, um, you know, uh, do psychogeography. I'm kind of just throwing this out, like Janet Cardiff. And then you would kind of talk about that a little bit. So it's usually a proposal um, at that point. Does that help answer that? So it's not so much a skill set in that way as it is just like, it's like, you send 10 images and a proposal and they're all going to ask for different things too. There's one residency in London that I just found out about who literally like makes their choices by lottery and everyone just sends literally answers, maybe like two very like demo demographic kind of questions. And then it goes into a pot and they choose their residence by lottery. Um, I mean, that's an, that's an anomaly, but yeah, there's, there's different, um, ways of applying what's asked of you. I do recommend, excuse me, I do recommend it. Like um, residencies are really uh, kind of, you know, very unique and a very um, like exceptional time and thing that you can do for your practice um, and for your experience. Um, 
just be as transparent as you can be like with yourself about what it is that you want and what do you want to have happen and do those deep dives into those databases um, to find out which residencies are out there that, that, that suit you and that fit that and ask people too, because these days um, artists like are really privy to what residencies are out there. Um, and if you ask someone, I want to do something that is like, you know, with a group of people, but I have a little bit of autonomy, like on my own, but we all come together for like, you know, like social time, like every evening, people will be like, oh, well, look at Bemis, look at like, um, you know, some smaller ones, um, like elsewhere, which is in uh, the East Coast. And um, yeah, I mean, people are going to kind of give you some suggestions too. So ask around. Yeah, Sarah. I was just going to add to your excellent answers here to Liz's good question. And I, I just want to say in terms of skills or things to, de to do in order to get chosen for a residency, get good at looking at deadlines and get good at applying. But when it's it, get good based on all the questions, your own personal answers to all the excellent questions that Patty laid out, like, like do that, give yourself time to think through what it is you want at this point. And that could change, you know, it's probably going to change year by year. But the main thing is to, you know, I, it's in some, to some degree, what I've seen over time is it's really a numbers game. The more you apply for, the more likely you are to get one mm -hmm. and the better you get at applying. Same thing with funding, you know, all these things are true. So the more habitual you make it or the more sort of you know, just like getting good at applying for things can help you um, be able to get uh, get a get chosen for a residency. As yeah, well. that's so true. And also, like, sign up for those newsletters on those four databases because I get them like once a month, and it's like, oh my god, I'm here, sitting here in my own little bubble in Minneapolis, you know, what I mean, <laughs> like doing my thing, and then I see that I'm like, holy crap, there's like thirty open calls coming up just, just this week, um, you know, like, so you can really like be thinking about, there's not like a, I mean, sometimes there is kind of like a, um, a time. I remember like um, Ziba, when we were talking at the end of last term and you were like, I missed the, I was geared up for Wasaic, which is this like really lovely and kind of big and now quite well-known um, residency that's run by artists in New York and upstate New York. And I was like, yeah, but there's all these other ones out there. You know what I mean? Like, yes, there is kind of that, like, um, you know, a time to apply to some of them, but um, there's as many like rolling deadlines and open deadlines um, that we just don't know about. So do sign up to, for those newsletters. You'll be surprised by what comes. So just to follow up uh, all these amazing um, comments and experience shared, um, what would be your advice for uh, someone who's um, who's applying for residences for the first time? So what would your advice be? Wow. Um, my advice would be to uh, do that deep dive research that I talked about to figure out which ones actually are the ones that you offer the things that you're looking for. I mean, I think the the worst sort of experiences that I've heard people talk about is when like, they went on a residency not realizing it was going to be something totally different than what they wanted. Um, sometimes that's because you don't really realize what it is that you want. Um, you know, or you went there wanting to have like this collective environment and where everybody like hooks together every night. And in fact, there was only like one or two other people there and you only saw each other like, you know, whatever from like six, six to eight o'clock at night or something. Um, you know, so, so kind of that, that will be there in the, in the websites and, you know, the different things like, um, you know, you can find out like what each one is sort of like, um, and ask people, like ask other people, you know, what, I, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I do. What do you recommend? Um, and, um, people will share that with you. Um, the first time I would also say, have somebody read through whatever is the thing that you've written or the, the thing that you've like are proposing to send to them that they've asked for. Um, and, but have somebody read through that and, and be sure it sounds, it says the thing that you think that it's saying or that you want it to say. 
Um, and somebody who can also like look at the call like pretty closely. Uh, what is it that they're actually asking for? You know what I mean? Not what you think it might be. Um, and be sure that those two things match up. And I would say that for lots of things too. Like if you're going on to other like, you know, PhD or other schooling or any, any of those things that you might be looking at for their education or something. I always have, some, I always, I still do that. I have somebody else, I have my partner look at like, this is what they're, I think this is what they're asking for. Is that what I'm, am I reading this right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, I would say don't worry too much about like, I mean, it's good to have good documentation, but don't worry too much about like, if they're asking for 10 images, are you like, you know, show, showcasing yourself the best and, you know, things like that. I found that for residencies, that's not so as important. It's not like when you're sending your uh, images out for a show where they're actually going to look at, um, they want to know what your product looks like or your output looks like, because often residencies don't really care very much what your output looks like, because in residencies, it's much more about process. And so you could even like put some images in there that in there that are about like your process in your studio. Um, and you can talk about that in your proposals because those are kind of more the things that they're interested in. But each one is gonna, should be pretty specific about like what they're asking for. Perfect, uh, so uh, that means, um... What you want to do and why you are you want to go to the residency is uh, uh, usually more important for them than what you have done so far or what you are making exactly. Okay, yeah. that's a really good um, uh, thing to know. Yeah, it depend and again, it does depend on the residency for sure. But that is the general, you know, kind of kind of gist of that. So. Um, yeah, I do if you if you want to um, like make work for a month and then have them show your work, like look for those kind of residencies that do that. They're out there, right? Where like the sort of show in you know Puglia, Puglia Italy is like or whatever in Florence, Italy is like embedded in as part of the residency. Like it happens at the end of the three months, for example. Um, yeah, and if you're not interested in that, then look for ones that don't do that. There's just as many that do and that as don't. There's so many residencies these days and so many different types that like, you know, in a way as an artist, it's kind of like, um, it's like um, this beautiful like jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> like you can really, really be like, what do I want right now? And it might be different than what you want next year and different than what you want the year before and different than what you wanted last year. It's just like, what do I, what do I need right now? You know? I might need to go on a residency that is not so far away from my house or is maybe in my, you know, is in the city next door or maybe even in my own city because I have a family and I need to be here and I, um, you know, I need to be in touch with like, you know, my, my mom who, you know, needs help or whatever. I'm just saying like there, you can like really think about how you're situating yourself. Like it used to really be that residencies were like this kind of exotic getaway. Like, um, you know, I'm, all this residency is going to be on the ocean and Cadiz and, you know, all these things. And those are totally out there. So if that's what you want, go find it. But also they're really um, as equally in more pedestrian places, um, more kind of like small and soft environments. Um, and also, you know, kind of close to home, we have several residency projects here in, in, in Minneapolis, like in the Twin Cities. Um, we have some in like northern Minnesota, like Aaron Spangler has started one um, up in Park Rapids. And um, yeah, so I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's many in, uh, in Chicago, obviously, but between here and Chicago, there's Poor Farm, which is like um, kind of on a farm in, um, in Wisconsin, like across the border. And that's run by... Um, the lovely people who run Suburban in the, in uh, Chicago and who teach at uh, SAIC. Uh, so there's like, you know, a lot of like smaller um, forms of residency that aren't like, you know, go to the ocean. And it's, just, it's a, it's a great big kind of bombastic sort of deal. So yeah, you, you, you should be able to find something that suits you. It's a really great thing to do after uh, you graduate. 
I think it's a really good thing to do between graduation and then kind of getting out there as an artist. It's a good like stepping stone. Also, once you have been on residency, then you are more likely to get residencies more. Like it's kind of a, it, it propagates itself. That's definitely a thing. I don't know why that is. I mean, it is a CV builder and most, most residencies will ask for your resume or your CV. And once they see that, maybe it's like a trust kind of thing, like a trust issue. It's like, oh, well, if they've been on a residency and it's, you know, presumably gone okay, then like we can trust that they're going to come here and, you know, not be rude and not ruin the place and not, you know, whatever. So, um, yeah, that, that's definitely a thing that happens. Um, I mean, I didn't say this either, but there's also like residency hoppers. That's a thing. That's where like artists literally like give up their leases in their home city for like a year or even longer, maybe two. And they just line up residency after residency after residency. And so they kind of get rid of the notion of like a car payment and a lease or a mortgage or whatever. I mean, or not mortgage, of course, if you buy, but like rent, I mean, you know, you get rid of all of your kind of like, um, you know, shackles and you, you, you go join the circus basically for like a year or two and you, and you bounce from residency to residency. That's a thing. I mean, I would say that like people in the residency world have kind of like, uh, frowned on that a little bit just because, um, um, it, it's, it feels somehow like kind of exploitative in a way. And also like, um, like it, um, those people sometimes aren't very happy. They end up spending a lot of time in residency, just lining up the next one. Um, anyway, but, but that is a thing. And so you can do that a little bit. Oh, sorry. I, I just scooted down. And then I saw, I have a little question. I'm sorry if I repeat something, my phone acted odd and I couldn't hear a segment. Oh, what's your question? Hi. Uh, Hi. So I kind of wanted to ask uh, what an international student might uh, face, um, like for for applying in residency, because there might be like a lot of visa restrictions and everything. So would there would there be like uh, some sort of requirement that I would have to fill out as an international student to mm -hmm. be a residency in any of the state outside Minneapolis? That's that's a really good question. And I would say that you should, um, first of all, talk to like uh, an immigration lawyer uh, just to get advice there, but it would be like an institutional residency that would be able to afford you the visa. It couldn't be like my residency project because I can't do that. I can't like sponsor you like basically, right? But one of the bigger ones could, Wasaic could, um, like a Bemis Center could Headlands Center, which is in San Francisco, like Sausalito. Um, it's, it's the bigger institutional ones that would be able to, a residency that's also like couched within like a university would be able to do that. Uh, I can add, you. So oh, you can add my experience too? Yeah, please. Um, so I've been in residences when I was on a student visa. And if you're still in, in inside of the territory of the states, you don't need any extra thing. Oh, great. Thank you so much. So I think, um, yeah. any question, anyone? And you know, feel free. I'm on. I'm. I'm in the MFA building on Mondays, but I'm in the main building on Thursdays and Fridays and a bunch of other times. <laughs> so, like, feel free to just you know shoot me an email and ask me any other questions that come up or anything. Like I said, I mean, this is not proprietary information. Like, I gleaned all of this information just because I studied this so uh, intensely when I did my PhD, and I'm happy to share it. I'm happy to yeah, direct you anywhere. If you have really specific questions, please ask me because I might have an answer. Like I might just be able to connect you one way or another, you know, if you're like, I want to do this, I want to do something like with people, but in the Scottish Highlands, like blah, blah, blah. I can be like, try this, try that, try that. So definitely hit me up. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Patty. It was uh, great and it was um, Thank you. a really um, 
great amount of um, information to not to start applying, but also being a little bit more advanced in getting into residences. Yes, I hope so. I hope that uh, works. And I'm seeing a lot of thank yous coming in uh, the chat as well. Thank you. So thank Aww. you, everyone. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. It was inspiring. 